If you've been around here for a while, you know that we have, as a church, this long-standing connection uh, and commitment to the country of Vietnam, specifically a little town in the northeast corner, uh, way up in the mountains, called Ba Ca. For the last 10 years, we've partnered with uh, an elementary school there, the Tai Zheng Pho uh, Elementary School, and we've taken teams, usually about twice a year, we've taken teams in and provided them with clean drinking water, we've built uh, buildings, constructed uh, playgrounds, we poured lots of concrete. Uh, through our partnership with Children's Hunger Fund, we've been able to put thousands, literally thousands of pairs of brand new shoes on little tiny feet and give away probably 10,000 Beanie Babies, which is amazing. In November of 2019, <clears throat> right before COVID hit, we were able to take and send our first medical mission team. We took 10 uh, medical personnel over and through our partnership with the Pediatric Hospital of Hanoi, they were able to see over 1,100 kids in three days. 1,100 kids and give well checks, provide medicine. Yeah, this is good. And this is not even the good part yet. I'm getting there, so you hold that. 1,100 kids in three days. It was an amazing thing. Uh, one of the things that, through the help of Matt Allen, we were able to establish about eight years ago was a nutritional program. And so because of you and because of your faithfulness to give uh, each and every week, for the last eight years during the school year, we have provided uh, uh, about 300 kids with, with milk and rice every day of the school year, starting in September and going through, through May. And you wouldn't think that a box of milk would be uh, that big of a thing, but it literally has changed the lives of these students and their families. Teachers are telling us and the people that we work with that, that the kids are, are healthier, they're more engaged. Uh, the retention rates, the attendance rates uh, have skyrocketed because of this because they can go to school and be fed, all because a church in San Antonio, Texas decided that we're going to make a difference in the lives of people. We're going to live in the end. We talk about this all the time, loving God and loving others. And so, so here's what we can celebrate. This, because of you, Alamo Community Church, this past school year, you provided 28,620 boxes of milk and bowls of rice to almost 300 students in the Taijing Fo School. And so I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Now you can clap for the opportunity to do this. It's, it's been a while since we've been able to go to Vietnam because of, of COVID, but, but we are hoping that, that in the next few months that we'll take uh, in November, we'll send our second medical mission team. I'll give you more information uh, about that. But if you've been with us to Vietnam, you know that we, we work hard and we try to play hard as well. And so there's always an opportunity to do a little bit of uh, exploring. There's always an opportunity to do a little bit of shopping. The likelihood is you are wearing something right now that says made in Vietnam because that is a big thing in Vietnam. And so when we go uh, to Vietnam, if you are a bargain hunter and you like things like North Face and Nike and uh, Ray-Ban sunglasses, then, then you should go on this trip with us to Vietnam. <laughs> now, it, it's, it's one of those things, um, though, that when you go, you have to be fairly discerning. You have to be a little bit, uh, you have to pay attention to some, some things. Because if you're not careful, you'll come home with North Forest, or we had a guy came home one time with a pair of Nakes, N-A-K-E, Nakes, or some, or some Roy Buns, those kind of things. You just have to be careful. When I go to Vietnam, there's a lady that owns a shop across the hotel that I stay at in Hanoi, and I've, we've become friends. Her name is Lee, and so I always try to go to her shop and, and shop with Lee because, one, she, she speaks perfect English, and so that's helpful, and two, she usually has some things that, that I want or my family wants, and so one time I was there, and I was looking at a jacket. It was a, 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 a poncho. It was a North Face poncho in one of those little containers, you know, that you can roll up for hiking and stuff. And I don't know why that I looked at it, because I don't hike, and I don't like the outdoors. But I was looking at this jacket, and, and Lee came up to me, and she said, oh, you, you don't want that jacket. And I said, I don't. Why not? And she said, because that one's not real. I said, oh, okay. And so she went to the back, and she brought me what looked like the exact same thing, and she said, this one's real. And I said, well, how much is the not real one? And she said, well, that's $10. And I said, well, how much is the real one? And she said, well, that's $25. And I said, okay. And I said, but this one is real. And she said, yes, this one is 80% real. 
<laughs> Wait, <laughs> how can it be 80% real? But it was 80% real. And so I bought the $25 one and brought it back. And to be honest with you, I couldn't even tell the difference between either of the jackets. The, they looked the same. The only difference that I knew of was the, the price. And the, real, uh, the reality is a lot of times it's very difficult to identify something that is real and something that is fake. But the truth is, even when something is 80% real, it's still 20% fake. So for a while now, we've been working our way through the Gospel of Luke. And this morning, we come to Luke chapter 13. Now, last week, it was Father's Day, and we skipped ahead to Luke 15. But this morning, we're going to go back to Luke chapter 13. And to understand what is happening, though, in Luke chapter 13, you have to know and understand what was happening before that, what Jesus had been doing prior to this time. In Luke chapter 9, in, in verse 51 in particular, Luke tells us that Jesus sets his face toward Jerusalem, or he resolutely sets out toward Jerusalem. And so he and his disciples begin to make their way from the Galilee area to Jerusalem. It's a, it's a journey that would normally take about four days, five days perhaps, but for them it took closer to four, and a, uh, four to, to five months because they stopped along the way. They, they ministered in towns, they ministered in, in villages, teaching and performing miracles. But everything that happens from Luke chapter 9 on to the end of Luke happens under the looming shadow of the cross. Jesus is going to Jerusalem to lay down his life, to die. And we begin to see fewer miracles from Jesus and more teaching, more parables. Now, it doesn't mean that he wasn't performing miracles. He was performing miracles. What it means is that Luke wants us to pay as much attention to what Jesus was saying as to what he was doing. And so as Jesus teaches and performs miracles, we remember from last week, he was surrounded more and more by, by people who were considered outcasts. He was surrounded more and more by people who were unwelcomed in society. And he had more confrontation. You don't think of Jesus as being confrontational, but he had more confrontation with the religious leaders, specifically the Pharisees. And his confrontation centered around primarily the burdensome rules, the overburdensome rules that these Pharisees had placed on the people. God had given Ten Commandments to follow, but over the years, the Pharisees had added more than 600 rules by which they needed to live. And they were these religious laws that were just burdensome. But the Pharisees, they were smart. They were smart people, and what they had realized that these, all of these laws that they were having the people abide by, they discovered loopholes in their own laws. And so what they required of every, everyone else wasn't necessarily what they were requiring of themselves. On the surface, they looked like genuine followers of God, but once you brought them home, they were a pair of nakeys. If I were to gauge the number one objection that I've heard over the years to Christianity, and specifically the church, it would be that Christians are hypocrites. They don't practice what they preach. We're really good at telling everybody else how to live their lives, not so much on our own. But it's not only people outside of the church that were bothered by hypocrisy. Jesus was bothered by hypocrisy as well. When we read the Gospels, what we find is that what we find that Jesus called out the most throughout the Gospels was not adultery, it was not stealing, it was not greed. What Jesus dealt with most in the Gospels was hypocrisy. Because if even, even if something is 80% real, it's still 20% fake. And in Luke chapter 13, Jesus is going to do the same thing. He's going to call out hypocrisy, but it looks a little bit different. He does it in a way that's, that's easy to miss. It's easy to overlook, at least at, at first. In Luke chapter 13, Jesus takes two current events from his time, two things that happened, and he uses them as an opportunity to teach on authenticity. And what he says is that authenticity in our lives begins with repentance. And so Luke writes in verse 1 of Luke chapter 13, now, there were some present at the time who told Jesus about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mixed 
with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? It was a rhetorical question because he says, I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were more guilty than the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. In these first few verses of Luke chapter 13, there's so much there, but you you have people who are asking Jesus about the current events, something that happened in their community, something that had taken place. And then Jesus adds a second event. There is an event of, of moral evil, and there's an instance of natural evil. The moral evil was that there were worshipers who were murdered in the temple, who were murdered in the synagogue while they were offering sacrifices. Now, the Jewish historian tells us this. We don't learn about this in Scripture, but there's historical accounts of this. The Jewish historian Josephus tells us that Pilate, who was the Roman governor, had authorized the seizing of money from the temple. He had authorized taking temple funds in order to construct an aqueduct. And so these soldiers go into the temple to seize the money, but they took it a step further. And then not only did they take the money, did they steal the money from the temple, that they, they actually slaughtered the people who were there offering their sacrifices. They murdered them. And as you might imagine, news had spread. And so when, these, when the people came to Jesus, they're saying, hey, did you hear about this? What do you think about that? There was some anxiety gripping them. That was a moral evil. The natural evil that Jesus repre- uh, referenced happened in a town of Siloam where there was a tower that fell. We don't know if the tower was being constructed. We don't know if it was a a, a long-standing tower. We don't know. But we know that the tower fell, and when it did, 18 people died. It was nothing that was intentional. It was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. An instance of, of moral evil and an instance of natural evil. And in the first few verses of uh, of Luke chapter 13, you have these people coming to Jesus, and here's their question. Which of these people who died, whether they were in the temple or they were under the tower, which of these people who died were worse and who deserved it more? Seems like a crazy idea. It it seems like something that, that we would have a hard time wrapping our mind around. But this was what was being taught. This is what they grew up to believe. This is what was being said by the Pharisees, that nothing happened by chance. If something happened to you that was bad, it was because you deserved it. It was, it was because you, you were bad. And you would think that, that this was not, this, we wouldn't think like that today. We, this is not something that would cross our minds. And yet, a number of years ago, when Hurricane Katrina hit the city of New Orleans, I heard all the time, where people were saying this was God's wrath on the city of New Orleans. It's the same principle. They must have done something bad to deserve what happened to them. It was a teaching that was so ingrained in them that that this was the first impulse of the disciples. In John chapter 9, Jesus and the disciples are walking uh, through the city, and they come to the temple, and there's a man that John says was sitting there who was blind from birth. Not just blind, but blind from birth. He's never seen Never had a vision, never had anything, blind from birth. And the disciples in in verse 2 of John chapter 9 asked Jesus the question, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents? Because if he's here blind from birth, if this is what has befallen him, then he must have done something to deserve this. And I read this, and I, and I can't help but think about all of the things that are happening in our country today, all of the things that are happening in our world today, all kinds of, uh, of issues of, of, of moral evil and, and natural evil and violence and chaos. And what Jesus says in the first few verses of Luke chapter 13 is, and he says it not once but, but twice, as you think about all of these things that are happening in the world around you, don't assign blame. Don't try to determine to determine who is the worst sinner because that's, you're missing the point. That's not really our responsibility. 
Our responsibility is to look at our own lives. Our responsibility is to look at ourselves and ask the question, what about me? You see, the the point of life, Jesus says, is this, that unless we repent, we too shall perish. Unless we repent, we're going to perish. Moral evil and and natural evil, they're, they're both reminders that we live in a fallen world and that one day we are all going to die. Aren't you glad you came to church this morning? And so Jesus says what's important then, what is the most important thing of our lives is that, that, that we repent while we still have time, that we turn from our sin, that we turn toward a Savior, that we turn from our sinful hearts and we trust in Jesus as the Savior and Lord of our lives, that, that we live in an attitude of repentance every day, ready to meet Jesus. And so these people came to Jesus and they presented him problems, but, but here's what Jesus did. When, when, when Jesus was presented with problems and people, he always addresses the people. He always addresses the person first. And he's saying to this crowd, the most urgent issue that you face doesn't depend on current events. It doesn't depend on, on your family str- struggles. It doesn't depend on political disagreements. It doesn't depend on financial difficulties. The most pressing issue that all of us face is the issue of our souls. In Mark chapter 8, Jesus asks the question, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit your soul, lose your soul? And after Jesus had answered the crowd's questions about whose sins were worse, he told them a parable, a story. In verse 6, Jesus told this parable. A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit, but did not find any. And so he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years now I've been coming in to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. So cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? And verse 8 says, sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year, and I'll dig around it, I'll fertilize it, and if it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. And like the story of the prodigal son that we studied last week, Jesus leaves this story unresolved. We don't know what happens. Did it bear fruit? We don't know. Did they cut it down? We don't know. He doesn't tell us. But what this story, what this parable tells us is that that while the grace and mercy of God is unmerited and unlimited, our time on this earth is not. Jesus uses the story of this fruitless tree to tie into the current events that he referenced earlier. Life is like a vapor. Life is like a mist. We don't know when it's going to end. We don't know when it's going to be taken from us. Life is like a mist, and none of us are guaranteed another day. So make the most of today. Paul would say, redeem the time, redeem the day. There's still time. Jesus is gracious. He's patient. He's waiting. There's time. Luke says, Luke chapter 3 says, produce fruit. Now is the reference. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And so the story of the barren fig tree, it's only recorded here in Luke's gospel. And Jesus Jesus tells us this story to drive home the point that we are all sinners in need of grace. There's not one more so than the other. There's not one more person in this room more deserving than another. No one sin is more serious than than someone else's. We are all sinners in need of a Savior. And as followers of Jesus, repentance, Scripture teaches us, is not optional. In fact, we're all called to live in this continual state of repentance, to take up our cross daily and follow Him. And when we do that, we find that God is merciful and patient and waiting for us. He's patient with us. And there's freedom in repentance because God immediately gives us grace. 2 Peter 3.9 says says it this way, The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, 
as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. The word perish here does not mean to die. I mean, we're all going to die. That, that's going to happen to us. The word perish means to suffer complete destruction or complete ruin beyond death. Beyond death. And God doesn't want that for anyone. He doesn't want anyone to perish. It's why he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes on him should not perish, but can have everlasting life. And so after Jesus answered the questions from this crowd, and he told this story of the fig tree, Luke tells us that he makes his way to a local synagogue, and he begins to teach. And in verse 10, Luke writes, on a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues, and a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over, couldn't straighten up at all. This woman was more than likely middle-aged. She was all hunched over. She couldn't stand up. For the last 18 years, she had been afflicted. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine what life was like for her in that culture? She couldn't stand. She couldn't sit comfortably. She, she couldn't lie down except on her side. She had difficulty eating. Walking was difficult. Her, her appearance was pitiful. Her, her face was just etched with pain. And this wasn't a form of arthritis. She was, this was caused by a spirit. She was under demonic attack, and it had wrecked her body for 18 years. And everyone in the crowd saw her and thought, I wonder what she did. I wonder what she did to deserve that. It must have been bad. She obviously made God really mad at her to be this afflicted. And she would have been isolated in her community. She would have been an outcast. She, she would have been discouraged and depressed and lonely. There must have been times where she felt abandoned by God. And yet there she was in the synagogue, in the temple, worshiping God. There she was on the Sabbath. And in verse 12, Luke says, when Jesus saw her, I love that. Nobody else noticed her. She's in the back. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward. He stopped what he was doing. I, I love the fact that Jesus stopped in the middle of his teaching when he saw her. Because that's what he does. He, he sees the overlooked. He sees the undervalued. He, he sees the one that no one else pays attention to. He saw her and he stopped what he was doing and he called for her to come forward. He focused on her. Well, what he was saying that day, what he was teaching was important, but not as important as her. When presented with problems and people, Jesus always addresses the person first. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, woman, you are set free from your infirmity. And then he put his hands on her and immediately she straightened up and praised God. Did you notice the word that he used? He, he didn't say, woman, you are healed. He said, you are set free. And immediately she stood upright and began to praise God. And you would think that everyone in the temple that day would rejoice. Everyone in the temple would celebrate with her. Eighteen long years she's been crippled, and now she's set free. Eighteen years she has been hunched over, and one moment with Jesus has changed everything. You would think this would be a time for a celebration. But in verse 14, Luke writes, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue leaders said to the people, not to Jesus, said to the people, there are six days for work, 
So come and be healed on one of those days, not on the Sabbath. What an awful thing to say. How unsympathetic can one be? This man had no compassion. He, he had no empathy. There, there was no recognition of a life that was changed miraculously right in front of his own eyes. A life that had once been broken, now restored. He valued rules over the people the, the rules were meant to serve. He couldn't grasp that the Sabbath was, was made for man and not, not man for the Sabbath. And, and, what, and in what should have been the most incredible day of this woman's life, this synagogue leader comes in and he decides to make it all about himself, all about his self-righteousness and his arrogance. And instead of joining hands to celebrate this woman who had been set free, he tries to place her back into bondage in her shame, in her guilt, in her isolation. Can I just say to you this morning that if you have ever been on the receiving end of condemnation from, from some selfish, angry, arrogant, prideful person who calls themselves a spiritual leader, I'm sorry. From the bottom of my heart, I am sorry that that happened to you. And what I want you to know is that does not represent our Savior. That does not represent Jesus. And it certainly doesn't represent this church. The synagogue leader rebuked the people. But in verse 15, the Lord answered him. I love that. And he said, you hypocrite. Don't each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or your donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it water? Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her? The word hypocrite that Jesus uses here is a, is a word that comes from the Greek word hypocrites. And it was a word that was used to describe an actor someone who put on a mask, someone who wore a mask, someone who pretended to be something that they're not. And Jesus says, you're, you're a hypocrite. You're pretending to be something that you're not. Jesus calls out this leader for his hypocrisy. He says, you treat your animals better than you treat this woman, this daughter of Abraham. Jesus, who was, who was full of grace and full of compassion and full of mercy, he spoke truth from his heart to whomever he was talking. His harshest words, his confrontational words were reserved for those spiritual leaders who would, who would say one thing but then do another. The leaders for whom the rules never seemed to apply. Those who were 80% real. Hypocrisy is dangerous in, in our lives and it's dangerous in the church because it's, because it's just close enough to the real thing that most of us don't know. It's a fake. The questions that Jesus had for the synagogue ruler, it turned up the heat on this guy. It boiled him in his own pot of rules and, and regulations, his hypocrisy. The question is, do you really value your animals more than this woman? And when he asked this question, verse 17 says, all of his opponents, that's the Pharisees, were humiliated. But the people were delighted with all of the wonderful things that Jesus was doing. In ancient Rome, sculpting was a popular profession. There was a huge demand in the marketplace for, for these different types of sculpt, sculptures, mainly of Roman gods, but, but different art pieces. But the demand was so great that the, that the genuine artisans, the, the local artists, couldn't keep up with the, the demand. And in the void, a lot of pretend artists came onto the scene. A lot of people who really didn't know what they were doing came on the scene to, to make a, a quick buck. Grifters. And these fake artists, they, they would create sculptures to make money, but, but they really didn't produce great work. They really didn't produce a great product. So in order to distinguish themselves from the 
bad product, the inferior product, the genuine artisans, the true artists began to mark their statues with the Latin word, two Latin words, sine sera. Sine sera. It's from where we get our word sincere. Sine means without. Sera means wax. Without wax. Because what was happening is these fake artists would, would mold their gods or mold their piece of artwork, but there would be cracks, there would be flaws. And so they would take wax and, and fill them in and then overlay it with paint or overlay it with, with gold. And so when you looked at it from the outside, it looked genuine, it looked real, but it was covered with wax. And so the artist, the true craftsmen, the, the genuine artisans, they would mark on their pieces of work, sine sera, without wax, and then they would set their work in the sun to test it, to prove it. And if it didn't melt, it was genuine. It would be shown to be authentic. Jesus said that authenticity begins with repentance. And repentance begins with us. The Pharisees were busy watching everyone else. They had spent their life making sure that everybody else followed the rules, stayed in line, kept the regulations, and they let you know about it. They, they had spent their lives watching everyone else, and they had lost sight of the fact that they were full of wax. They were fake. It wasn't that they weren't believers in God. I don't want you to hear that. They were. They believed in God. It wasn't that they didn't value the Scriptures. They did. They memorized them. They, they tried to live it out. It wasn't that they, they didn't want to li live a life pleasing to God. It was the fact that they became so focused on what everyone else was doing that they lost sight of what was happening in their own lives. They became so focused on who was the worst sinner and who was doing that and who was doing this and who shouldn't be doing that and why would they do that that they, they couldn't even see what they had become themselves. They, they were waiting for others to trip up and they didn't even realize that they were living a life full of wax and just melting. Authenticity, sincerity in our life, genuineness in our life begins with an understanding of, I'm not worthy. It begins with a, a repentant heart, daily taking up our cross and following him. Can I let you in on a little secret about me? And I think it's safe to say about this church, we're dysfunctional. We kind of put the fun in dysfunction. And the old saying is, everybody's normal until you get to know them. But we're all sinners, saved by grace. We're all sinners in need of of grace. We're all sinners rejoicing at the lavish grace of God poured out on us so undeservedly. That's who we are. That's what this church is about. That's what, that's what being genuine, repentant followers of Jesus Christ is all about. That we can come to a place where all of us have sinned, all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. None of us are perfect. We all struggle. And yet together we can experience God's grace as we go on this journey. No more having to pretend to be something that we're not. No more hiding. No more hypocrisy. No more melting in the sun. Because at the end of the day, when we do that, the only person that we fool is ourself. Authenticity begins with repentance. And when it comes to repentance, 1 John 1, 9 says this. That if we confess our sins, he, he being God, is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and will purify us. Your version may say cleanse us. He will purify us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All throughout Scripture, we find this connection of these, of these words. 
pure hearts and, and clean hands. The psalmist says it like this in Psalm 24. He asks the question, who may ascend to the mountain of the Lord? And who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands. The one who has a pure heart. Washing hands. Purifying hearts. In the Old Testament, King Solomon, when he built the temple, he placed around the temple ten uh, different wash basins. They were all around the temple. And so anyone who would enter the temple would wash their hands. And it wasn't for hygiene. It really wasn't, you know, to get rid of germs. It wasn't a COVID thing. It was because coming in before God, when you washed your hands, it represented repentance. It represented authenticity, an authentic and repentant heart. Clean hands represented a repentant and sincere genuine heart. And so that's what we're going to do today. That's what I want to do as we just close this out this morning, as we worship together. We're just going to participate in that very ancient ritual, and together we're going to wash our hands as a way to symbolize that Jesus is the one. He's the only one that can purify our hearts. We can't purify ourselves. It's the, it's the blood of Christ. It's the his sacrifice that purifies our hearts. So we don't have wash basins. But when you came in this morning, you were handed a wet wipe. Because every parent knows that wet wipes are of God. <laughs> and here's what I want you to do. You, you can hang on to it. You can keep it as a reminder that, that clean hands represent a pure heart. Or you can tear it open right now as a sign between you and God. That you want to stop pretending. That you want to take off the mask. That you want to live in genuine authenticity with a sincere and pure heart before God. Not before me, not before this church, but between you and God. That you're going to stop settling for the 80%. That you're going to just live your life as a devoted, repentant follower of Jesus Christ who pours out his love, who pours out his grace, who pours out his mercy on each of us. And he's patient, and he's waiting, and he's calling, and he's longing for you to come to him. So, Father, I thank you for your grace, for your mercy, and for your patience. Lord, there have been so many times in my own life that, that it's remained fruitless. Just barren. And when you had every right to cut it down and throw it away, you did it. You pruned. You cultivated. You cared for. You were patient and gracious and merciful. Father, I love that there is freedom when we take off our mask and we just stop pretending. So today, would you allow us to experience your freedom from the very things that we've been hiding, even this week, in the very areas we, where we feel the most shame. God, would you cleanse us? Would you purify us? Would you make us new? Lord, where we have secret struggles, I pray that you would help us to lay those down, confess them to you, knowing that you are a good father who forgives. Give us the courage, Lord, to stop acting, stop pretending, stop being something that we're not, to be authentic, to live a life full of repentance, laying down our pride and picking up our cross every day. For it's in the name of your son, Jesus, that we pray all of these things. Amen.